G'day guys, welcome to the process of success. This is episode number eight. I'm here with Australian 2020 and Western Australian Vice Captain Ashton Turner. Ash, thanks for joining me. For those of you that might not know too much about Ash's career, Ash has played three 2020 internationals for Australia, 33 first class uh, matches with an average of uh, 37, 24 list day matches and 58 T20 matches. So he's a really experienced cricketer and he's someone who's uh, right on the um, cusp of playing cricket, more cricket for Australia. So before we get into um, some questions, can you just take us back to your childhood? What's your earliest memory of playing cricket? Uh, I would have loved growing up with a few brothers, but unfortunately I just got a sister and I remember as a kid, well before I signed up to any junior clubs or played school career or anything like that, I was just I just loved playing cricket in the backyard and I'd drag anyone I could outside to I was lucky at home where I grew up that we had a great garage for playing cricket. Um, and I just remember that, you know, anywhere I was at home, at school, you know, in breaks, I'd just be trying to play as much cricket as I was. I just loved it. You know, you never think about making a career out of it at the time. It was just pure love for the game, really. And was that brought from watching TV, watching the TV and seeing cricket at home? Because I know that's how I got into it. I was at Christmas time, cricket would always be on the TV. But was that the same sort of thing for you? Or was it friends that played or? Yeah, I, I know that I watched cricket growing up. I loved it. But I, as a really young kid, you're more interested in getting out and trying it for yourself and, you know, playing outside. I remember, you know, if I'd sit down and watch a bit of cricket on TV, you know, before the session was over, I'd be outside playing and, um, you know, you certainly develop your love for the game by being exposed to the, you know, watching the Australian side on TV over summer and, you know, that that probably did ignite my love for it, but, um, yeah, it was pretty quick before I was out of the lounge room and outside playing, yeah. Nice one. And then what age and did you start playing competitively? Uh, I think it was under 10s I joined up at... Bicton Junior Cricket Club and from there I was probably really lucky in that I followed the pathway that the you know the Wacker and Cricket Australia set out and um, at the time you don't realise you're starting on that path but um, you know for me it was just a few of my mates uh, went to primary school with had started playing the year before and you know they got a few fancy medals and you know seemed to have fun so that was where it started for me. That's fun and then you said off air that you you went into Fremantle under 13s and here in Perth, that's a, a selection process. Is that the same sort of thing you went to there? Yeah. Oh, I remember just getting a letter in the mail to come and do some tryouts. And, you know, oh, being at Bixon Junior Career Club, I know that I'm actually in the Melville zone, but, um, you know, someone Gee, at Fremantle. would have loved to have you back then. Uh, Jeff Kennedy, I'm very thankful. He's um, picked me up and sent me an email. And sure enough, I was straight down to... The uh, Fremantle trials, and I was a fast bowler back then, so I tried my luck, and yeah, sure enough, I got picked up to play, and that was the start of a long journey. Nice, and so we I had Vogsy in here a while ago, and he started as a tearaway quick as well, and, and transitioned to a left arm Chinaman into a batter. How did how did your progression go from a fast bowler to a, a batting or rounder that bowls off spin? Yeah, well, I went from a fast bowler. I always loved batting, but I was probably a bit of a slogger probably am now still but I, um, <laughs> yeah I used to be a fast bowler and that's probably how I got picked in my junior teams and then at about under 14s or something like that I had a knee injury and as a result I was just playing as a batter and you know at that time I just loved to be involved in the game and you know I was still playing as a batter and just wanted to be involved and started bowling a few offies in the nets and then you know that started to translate to a few overs in games and I remember I went to the, got picked in the West Australian under 15s team, and pretty much that was one of the first carnivals where I bowled, um, you know, my offies, you know, in a competitive environment and played as a batter in the middle order and got a few runs. And I uh, don't think I ever bowled my same as ever again. Nice one. And now, how did your teenage years look? Were you, you said how you were playing in the backyard and then you went to Bicton. Did you start to sort of take it more seriously and, and practice every day? Did you? get any one-on-one -on -one coaching in there or how did, how did those days look in, in your life? No, it was really unscripted, really unplanned. Probably a regret I've got now was not um, having a, you know, specific skills coaches when I was younger. Um, I was really sort of taught myself and, you know, when you're playing with your mates, you learn off them and, you know, you're just trying to figure out ways to get better. Um, 
I think that that's an advantage in in some sense that you get a lot of freedom and you can play a game however you want to play. But I also know that there's some really basic technical fundamentals that I I would love to have learnt at a at a younger age. It probably would have helped the you know start of my first class career, or it might have meant that I could have played earlier. Sort of took me a while in the um, state system to develop a you know a defence that was going to let me play first class cricket. Um, but yeah, I think it was uh, it was a I'm lucky in that sense that my parents weren't cricket um, fans. They'd never really had any exposure to the game of cricket, so they let me go, um, and I had a really free learning experience as a as a kid. That's awesome, and I think it's amazing to hear different stories and different journeys. Some people have had a lot of coaching at a young age, and a lot of successful people haven't. They've just found their own way. Have you had any mentors throughout your career or coaches since you sort of got a bit older? Who who are the people that have guided you and helped you a lot throughout your career? Yeah, I mentioned Jeff Kennedy. He's um, he was my junior coach at Fremantle. He was probably the first one who, you know, provided this idea of batting technique to me. Before that, it was. Um, you know, see ball, hit ball, and I remember, you know, first training session, he tried to change the grip around on my bat, and I just thought, gee, this is not working for me, and, you know, I'm really thankful for some of those early pointers, because they really steered me in the right direction, and then once I started at um, Christchurch, started playing school cricket, had some had some coaches around there, and I, when I got to probably year nine or ten, I started having a few hits with uh, Mike Hirsch, who... I think he's a brilliant coach of um, you know young kids. Um, he he sort of again was steering me in the right direction, and all meanwhile I was sort of fighting this um, technique that I sort of developed from the backyard of just trying to see ball and hit ball and playing with a lot of freedom um, to trying to you know curb that a little bit and play with a bit more technique. Um, but yeah, there's so many more people to that I could name who have had influences on my career. I think more recently since I've been in the West Australian setup, Wayne Andrews has been brilliant for me. And um, even more recently, probably JL and Stewie Walters are coaches there, but probably Wayne Andrews has been the biggest uh, influencer for me. Nice one, nice one. Now, you mentioned just WA State 15s. Were you involved in the state um, pathways throughout the whole every age group when you were younger? Yeah, I was, yeah. Played in the, what is it, the zones, carnivals as a fast bowler, sort of younger. And then I remember getting picked again, like at Fremantle would go to trials for the West Australia under 15 side. And I remember being really nervous about that and I didn't even really want to go. Um, I remember the trials were at James Oval and I just felt really out of my depth. I wasn't a superstar youngster. I was, you know, one of the last picked in the team or, you know, just... You know, I wasn't I wasn't never captain of these sides. I never batted in the top four or five, and um, was a bit nervous. And then somehow we had a few a few practice games, and somehow I got through the, the through the cracks and got given in a crack in these practice games, and probably batted and bowled as well as I ever had. Probably was it um, probably a bit out of character, but somehow I got picked in this side. And you know, when you you start to go away on these rep carnivals and you go up to the next level and then you somehow perform in these games, you start to gain a bit of belief that you actually can do this. And, you know, for me, that was probably the start of, uh, you know, the pathway with Western Australia. And then from then I was able to go through the under-17s and the under-19s and then into the, the second 11. So, like I said before, it was I was really lucky in that I did follow that pathway that the Wacker and Cricket Australia set out. Little did I know at the time, but... Um, yeah, I was very fortunate. Awesome, and it's great to hear. I know we've got a lot of kids that contact us and they talk about missing out on sides or, or not being sort of selected and whatever, but a number of players who I've interviewed now have, have said how they've either missed out or they've just made it or they're a fast bowler and then make a career and play internationally as a batter. So it's not the be-all and end-all of that sort of age at all. So you then went on and represented Australia under 19s um, you went to India on a, on a tour and then they had a World Cup here in Australia how was that um, experience as part of your journey yeah it's funny like I still uh, this you know 17 18 you still don't have well, I didn't have that much self-belief and it was just really funny how it worked out that just a couple important games you know at underage carnivals where someone would be coming they'd come down and watch just one game I'd 
some of our pulls and runs out of the hat or you know i still didn't think i was one of the best cricketers in australia going around for my age group but somehow they gave me a chance to go away with the aussie under 19s and we had a tour to india which was you know as a kid who's grown up playing on carpet and you know turf wickets here in perth going over to play on the subcontinent as a really inexperienced cricketer was just a mind-blowing experience but um an amazing opportunity and you know I just learned so much and again it's just one of those another moments where you have a little bit of success in that format and then you know you gain more self-belief and you're you're one step closer to you know the dream that at the time you don't think it's realistic playing for Australia but you sort of you know you have that dream because everyone's got that dream um, and then we went to the uh, Townsville, we had our under-19 World Cup and to have that in Australia on familiar conditions was probably an advantage for, for us. Um, you know, again, we, we lost the final in that, but you know, I probably really surprised myself how well I played in that in that tournament. Um, you know, and we had a really good side, of probably more than half our team have played for Australia now at the senior level. Um, but yeah, that was awesome. and above everything else you know I was having so much fun doing this and this is before you're really thinking about being a professional cricketer this is before you're thinking about money this is before everything you're still just playing for because you love it and it's so much fun awesome and that's such an important thing now you've mentioned the self-belief a few times and you've mentioned having a lot of fun do you think because maybe you weren't quite sure you were good enough you didn't put too much pressure on yourself and that allowed you to perform at your best uh, yes, certainly. I think I touched on word freedom before with how you play, and um, you know, I think that playing with freedom—that's something that I've identified that when I'm playing really well, that's a that's a trait that's um, apparent. And I know that when I'm not playing well, I'm sort of tense up, and there's a lot less freedom in how I'm going about it. That can be my batting, my bowling, my fielding preparation. You know, how you're thinking it can be—it's really all-encompassing. So. Um, that's a really big part of my game at yep. the moment. Awesome. We'll, we'll get into that a, a bit more in a minute. Now, um, you then went and probably at this point or around this point, you made your first grade debut for Fremantle. How did that come about? Were you dominating second grade or was it because you'd played in the pathway and they were trying to fast track you a bit? Yeah, so it was something that I fought growing up because I was playing school cricket at Christchurch, which I loved. But, you know, in your school holidays, you I went back and played for Fremantle in the juniors. And at the time, I got a bit frustrated because I wanted some of my teammates. And, you know, like I said, I was never the best player. So some of my teammates were getting picked to play third and fourth graders, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds. I never really got that chance and played one fourth grade game as a fill in. I think one third grade game as a fill in. And then sort of out of the blue, I think I was probably 16, got picked for a second grade game. And I think that year I played two second grade games in the school holidays. And I think I got 40 or 50 in one of them and then went away with the WA under 17s and we, we won the national championships. And then the week I came back was sort of January. So still school holidays and out of the blue, got a call from Jeff Marsh and he was the coach at Fremantle at the time and said you're going to play A grade this week which you know I just couldn't believe and I think it was I came in I think Brett Dory played the first week and then got picked to play state cricket so someone had to come in and I took his spot and at the time for me thinking that the just imagining that the the selection of the state team was you know impacting my my life was just you know beyond belief really at the time and so I remember being really nervous and I know that I was nowhere near good enough at the time. So I was thankful to get that opportunity in my first game. I only played one game that year because I went back to school cricket. But, you know, to get your cap, like the the, um, the baggy blue cap that I got from Swampy that day, you know, I treasured it. It was like the most important thing in my life. And, um, yeah, that was just another step on this journey, really. Awesome. And how did you go in that match? Batted at nine. I only played one week of the game. Batted at nine, got 20 not out, got dropped three times. I remember it was the luckiest innings of my life, and I, sometimes I just wish I'd what I used up all my luck back then. <laughs> and I remember bowling a few overs at the end of the day. Um, remember that we played Claremont. They were a pretty good side. I remember bowling to Jim Allenby and some some really good players. So yeah, like I said, I was I was so far out of my depth. You know, I didn't know anything about my game at the time. You think you do, uh, but 
going from playing junior cricket to senior cr- cricket in a pretty short space of time was just a massive eye opener. And grade cricket for me it was really challenging at the start, and that transition did take me a while. Yeah, as it, I'm sure it does for everyone. But they obviously saw your potential and picked you on that. Um, now, what point did you start to think about playing professionally? You said at Aussie 19s, you probably still weren't even thinking you were good enough. What point did you think, hang on a minute, I'm actually quite good here. I, I can make a career out of this. Uh, well, it was never really about making a career. It was just about how do I get to play state cricket? How do I get to you know, then play for Australia? So it's not really a career aspiration. It's just a, you know, like I want to play cricket. I love playing cricket and you know, how am I going to do that? And, I remember the first time I really started thinking about it was before the 2012 under-19 World Cup. Probably most of our team had just before the tournament got given rookie contracts with their various states, and you know I, I hadn't been given one, and I got told I wasn't going to get one. And you know, there were, most of the other guys in the team had these rookie contracts. I remember being that was my first really heartbreaking moment. I thought. You know, I, I knew that I wasn't ready for state cricket, but just there were guys my age getting these rookie contracts, which is a brilliant concept. The rookie contracts, you know, they get young kids who aren't ready for state cricket into the system and, you know, they get to start to live like a professional cricketer. And that opportunity, I felt, had slipped me by and I was shattered. And then just about a week or two later, I don't know what the circumstances were, but they changed their mind and they gave me a rookie contract. And, you know, I was over the moon, went and played the under-19 World Cup in Townsville and then came back and just straight into, I'd missed most of the pre-season my first year and straight into the West Australian, um, you know, squad and that was challenging at the start because, like I touched on, I was so far away from being ready to play state cricket and you get thrown into these guys who are, you know, I looked up to, I was nervous speaking to them really, the first six months of my of my um, rookie contract and, um, yeah, that sort of, culminated in uh, somehow at the end of that season I, there were a few injuries and I got to play my first game for Western Australia in a one day game which is you know, an amazing experience and it all happened so quickly. Mm. And what was that experience like? It was in February 2013, age 20? Yeah so then I was still a, I was an off spinner really then and I remember Ash Agar had just burst onto the scene because Michael Beer had dislocated his shoulder and Ash Agar just played a couple of Shield games, done really well, and they sort of last minute flew him over to a test tour in India, which he, he didn't end up playing. He wasn't actually in the official squad, but I know that he was really close to playing. Um, and as a result, there was just this one game in the fixture, which was a one-day game at the Wacker. It was our last one-day game of the season against Tasmania. And, um, you know, sort of by default, I was the next spinner in Western Australia who was, who was uh, in the squad. And got picked, I kind of think it was the last game of the season that JL probably thought and the selectors thought nothing to lose, we'll give this bloke a go and you know, I, like a few other moments in my, in my cricketing life, you know, I really surprised myself, I played really well that day um, against, uh, we had a really good side, Huss was captain for us and Ricky Ponting was captain on the other side, there were some really good players playing and remember we lost that game but the self-belief I took out of that was unbelievable and you know, like that um, that baggy blue cap I got for Fremantle, this gold cap I got presented to me by Tom Moody. It just, you know, it was like the most important thing in my in my life at the time. Yeah, awesome. And then after that, you went to the UK and you had six months, which um, was tied up with the Cricket um, Australia Academy here. Um, how did you find that experience being sort of 20 years old, living in the UK, um, probably first time away from home long term? And yeah. how did you find that as a person and as a cricketer? Oh, looking back on it, it was, you know, an amazing experience just for my life. Um, I was so lucky to be given that opportunity. Um, you know, we were with some really good players in in, in my age group. I think um, Ashagar was there, Travis Head was there, uh, Will Bazisto was with us, Alex Keith, who's now playing footy for, for Adelaide, and Scott Henry, who was playing first class cricket at the time. We were all all together and playing league cricket over there. Like I said, I went into this summer being uh, being an off spinner who didn't really bat. In my first game of WA just before that, I batted eight and you know, I still loved batting, but I was thought that bowling off spin was gonna be my way into the 
to the West Australian side and you know I left that I left that summer over in England as a batter really I, you get a chance to bat up the order and I managed to get some runs and really get some self-belief and it was that that winter of 2013 that I you know I went to England as a bowler and came back as a batter and the next season I got picked as a batter for my first first class game for Western Australia which you know that was a really far-fetched idea even 12 months before that that was uh, Wayne Andrews was really good with my batting I was able to develop a bit of a technique a bit of a game plan to be able to score some runs in red ball cricket Awesome, awesome. And you made your first class debut in unusual circumstances. It was playing for Australia on their tour, um, their tour of the UK in 2013 with the likes of Smith and um, I think Ash Agar was in that game and um, all the big dogs. How did that come about? Oh, that was, yeah, probably the most surreal thing that's happened in my, in my cricketing journey so far. I was, um, it was a lot of the right place at the right time was in the middle of an Ashes series that was really challenging for the for the Aussie players. I know having lived with Ash Agar for the first stint of that time in the UK that when he got picked up to play in that test match, how amazing that was and talking to him about how tough it was and then so the nature of a test series like that, the Ashes, is that guys are going to want to have a rest and it was between the second and third test or the third and fourth test and not everyone in the squad wanted to play another tour game so I was sort of right place, right time. I needed a bowler and you know, I was bowling some offies in grade cricket or club cricket over there at the time and they just sort of got me in and, you know, just more so than playing, just being around the Aussie squad, being in the change room for, for a week or so. Um, you know, it, it was one of the biggest eye-openers that you can imagine. Um, I remember the, all of the guys were so good to me in that same Michael Clark was captain and, you know, like I said, Steve Smith was just emerging in the in the um, Australian side, and those guys gave me a lot of their time. And you know, just talking to them, I remember being nervous, just batting in the nets, you know, facing any of the bowlers. Which for me, I hadn't even played state cricket or first class a shield game in in Australia. So to be thrown into that environment was, you know, I was so far out of my depth, but I loved it. And it's another stepping stone that just, you know. It, it, it sort of hammered in the idea that yeah, well, I love doing this, and this is something I really want to pursue. Pursue. Um, yeah. yeah, what an amazing experience! It sounds like you've, you've mentioned a lot. You're out of your depth. You're out of your depth. You're out of your depth, and finally, at some point, you f- probably feel like you're in your depth. And and all those experiences in the past have probably fast tracked you in a way. Yeah. Would you would you say? Yeah, exactly right. And you know, at the time, you don't realise, but there's people selecting these teams for a reason, and. You know, I was really lucky that people were willing to take a chance on me. Um, you know, I don't know what they saw because I know I was, I wasn't that good a player. I, um, you know, I sort of fumbled my way through a lot of these teams that I was walking into and getting picked in. But I felt like most of these teams I get picked in that I was able to find my feet. You know, sooner rather than later. And you know, it's, it's like you got to find a way to survive. Otherwise, you'll be, you'll be out of the system before you know it. So. Yeah, really lucky and they see it so much with players now. They get picked probably before they're ready and they turn in really good players. So, you know, it's a proven formula for yeah. producing good players. Awesome. And now, fast forwarding um, to the last couple of seasons, you've become one of the most consistent batsmen for WA and probably in Australia as well. Was there anything in particular that's changed um, from those earlier seasons to now? Was it just maturing and understanding your game a bit more? Uh Oh, for me in red ball cricket especially playing shield cricket just having a really clear game plan like it sounds like a cliche but I promise you it's not in uh, in my case I, I was batting I look back on the early part of my first class career and I was really didn't know what I was doing at the time I thought I did and you think you know what you're in control of the game but I really didn't know and then over over an off season, working with uh, Wayne Andrews and Stewie Walters at the Wacker, I just um, so probably eighteen months ago, I I just really knuckled down on this game plan that I sort of identified what my strengths were and where I was going to be able to score my runs and you know what were the weaknesses that I just sort of had to let go and 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 uh, you know avoid those shots, avoid those scoring areas. And was that a 
talking through the process, sitting down, writing down with those guys, or was that just talking during a net session, or how did that actually look in that yeah, off season? Yeah, so it was a lot of uh, talking in net sessions, throwing balls, you know, a lot of uh, like game simulations, you know, where was I trying to hit the ball, what balls was I trying to score off, what balls were just I worked out were not in my zone, and you know they were just balls I wasn't even going to try. Um, a lot of it was working about my game plan against the short ball, which you know coming from junior cricket and stuff like that, I didn't have a really clear plan, and you know I identified that that wasn't a strength of mine, and that was uh, a lot of my work went into playing that, negotiating the short ball, and once I was really confident in my plans and how I was going to go out the bat, you know it was my game plan was down to. You know, what guard do I take for each bowler, like different bowlers, you know, my plan was changing for different bowlers, for spin, for seamers, playing at the wacker, playing over east. And I just felt like in this off-season, everything started to click. And I went from, I think I had one first-class 50 to uh, two years ago, averaging over 50 in a year of shield cricket. And that, for me, was just like a lights light bulb moment turning on and I just thought yep I figured out a way that I can score runs at this level and more importantly that I can help win games for WA um, you know it was the most fun I've ever had playing the early part of my shield career playing for Western Australia you know it's like you're living out a childhood dream and you know then you start to get some belief and realize you're actually having an impact and you belong in this team you know that was an amazing uh, sense of fulfilment for me awesome awesome well done and um you mentioned earlier about your defense and sort of um you didn't have a defense at a younger age was that something you focused on a bit during that time as well tightening up your defense uh yeah but i think a, a better way for me to sort of look at it was i was looking at the balls i could score off and i was really looking for which balls were in my zone to score and then if they weren't it was uh you know naturally it's a you're defending um, and I think that that was a positive instead of focusing on my defence I was focusing on how I was going to score and if it wasn't in my zone being um, making it really tough for the bowlers to get you out um, and a lot of my plans were you know I didn't know at the time but because I thought they were all about trying to score but a lot of them were actually helping me defend and um, you know, defence can be leaving the ball really well, yeah. getting out of the way, short ones, whatever it is. And it's sort of um, that pre-season, I was getting really clear on my game plans, but it's not until you go out and do it in for a season and it works that you get that... Um, um, yeah, it builds confidence that, yep, I've got a game plan. Yep, it's working and it's working in pressure situations. So you gain a lot of belief from that. Yeah, now... Not only did you have an excellent um, shield season where you say you averaged over 50, you also had a really good big bash. Something that I've sort of noticed is how sometimes players work on one part of their game, maybe their red ball cricket, and it might mean it's a to the detriment of their white ball game. How did you manage working on both aspects of your game? Because you're obviously developing your plans to the red ball, the swinging ball, but you've also got to keep working at hitting the, clearing the boundary to the, in the white ball game. Yeah, I felt like uh, two years ago I had a pretty good shield season um, that got me going. That year I had an okay big bash, but it was more like my fielding and my bowling and then batting as well. It was sort of three strings to my bow. It was probably not until this year that I felt really confident in my, my batting in 2020 cricket. And I think as a, you know, as a blessing in disguise after hurting my shoulder at the start of the season, I knew that I couldn't bowl or throw. So you know, I probably didn't think I was going to be picked to play just as a batter and once I did start to get picked and it was, that was a, I sort of stumbled upon a game plan for my batting in T20 cricket. Um, you know, and it's, it's not a cliche, but the, the reason that I felt like I've improved as a T20 batter, my game plan again, it's so different to my game plan in red ball cricket. It's like, they're like two different sports for me, the way I look at my batting in red ball cricket compared to white ball cricket. But I sort of stumbled upon a plan that was really working for me in T20 cricket and you know, I was lucky that the first game of the Big Bash this season, you know, it, it came off and then from then you just sort of get the momentum and run with it and, um, yeah, I just, my self-belief just, you know, blossomed really from in white ball cricket this year. Awesome, awesome. Now, I'll get on to that in just a minute, but taking you back to last summer, um, just over 12 months ago, you made your debut for Australia. 
played three 2020 internationals. How was that experience and how was it, first of all, getting told you were picked and then, and then walking out to play for the first time? Yeah, oh, surreal. Um, I was probably, it was a little bit like my first class debut when I played over in England for the Australian side. It was a little bit of a right place, right time. Um, there was a test tour that was about to go and some of the guys went away for that test tour. So it did mean that there were, not everyone was available for this T20 series in, in Australia against Sri Lanka. And, you know, by nature of that, you know, I sort of just got to fill one of these these holes that got left by one of the superstars who were away preparing for a test series. But, you know, that opportunity again, you know, I, pro I wasn't banging the door down to get picked. Um, you know, someone took a risk picking me. Um, you know, I was really lucky. And um, I know that last year, you think at the time that you're, you're prepared and you're ready to go and your game's complete, but I know looking back 12 months down the track that I was so far away from having a complete game plan and I know that I've become a lot better player um, as a result of that and you know the result of playing more games in the Big Bash. I think my game's changed changed a lot, but you know just to get that taste, just to sit in the change rooms and you know wear the Aussie badge on your shirt, you know that's just really like so many teams have been picked in before it just sort of another step and you know fueling that uh, love for the game and you know just fuels your hunger and did that improve you that belief that you've spoken so much about did that sort of you look around and say i'm playing for australia i, I do belong yeah definitely um you know i didn't have a lot of success in those three games but you know i picked up a few wickets here and there opened the bowling a few times got some couple runs late in the innings and you know you just every time you're there it's like Yep, playing against Sri Lanka here and there. They're a pretty good side, but I've faced bowlers, you know, this good in the big bash. And, um, you know, you just got a bit more added pressure, you know, playing for your country. There's a lot more people sort of, uh, you know, hoping you do well. And um, there's a lot more people who are disappointed if you don't do well. So um, it's just a, there's a more of a microscope on your performances. But yeah, I loved it. I loved every bit of it. Um, you know, I like playing in these high pressure games, uh, you know, and it's something that I'm, it's a real clear f um, goal for me is to get back into that side. Awesome, awesome. Now you mentioned the Big Bash we've just finished, BBL 07, and um, it seemed like every time you got a start, you played a match winning innings, you, you scored 70 off 32 balls, 50 off 27, 45 off 32. Um, I found it fascinating watching the Big Bash quite closely, and you, you mentioned this previously, with the freedom that you played with. It looked like no matter what the situation was, no matter what the, the run, whether you were batting first or second, it looked like you just played with complete freedom. Um, what was your mindset? What, like you said, you had your game plan and that was a big sort of changing point for you. What was your mindset going into each match, I suppose? Yeah, well, it, it sort of comes back to my game plan. It was, it was so simple in that, um, you know, if a ball was in this area, I felt like I was gonna, if it was in one of my scoring zones or a boundary zone, that I was just gonna try and hit it for six or hit it to the boundary, no matter of the situation. And if it wasn't in that zone, then I wasn't really gonna try and manufacture something because I know that having failed so many times before, that that's a that's a really bad percentage play for me. And you know, quite often I can get out trying to score off something that I know is really not in my zone, and it just happened that. Uh, a lot of times we were chasing big totals and so um, you can sort of mask all the risks you're taking but for me you know it actually wasn't the game scenarios that uh, was getting me to take these risks it was more that that was just a part of my game plan and whether we're batting first second chasing a big score a little score I was going to bat the same way um, and yeah I just after you come off in the first game and the second game and you just get that belief to just keep backing yourself and didn't really matter who the bowlers were. A lot of the game plan was also around uh, boundary sizes and attacking which ends you can attack and you know where your percentages are to try and try and you're obviously always taking risks for playing the percentages and what are the risks worth taking. And did you sort of look at the opposition and, and target a certain bowler if they had a left arm spinner and you thought you could hit him well or an offy or whatever, a medium pacer, did you target a certain bowler or it was just if a ball lands in there, I know I can hit anyone? Yeah, it was more about, uh, I feel like in the big bash, we always play on end wickets. You've always got a shorter boundary and a longer boundary and I felt like my game plan was a lot around attacking the short boundary and you know, unless it was someone who was a really good bowler, like a spinner, you know, I wasn't really sure about or someone 
doing something a slow ball wasn't quite picking unless it was something like that i was pretty much just it didn't matter who was bowling i was going to try and target that shorter end play the percentages and when i was hitting to the long end try and knock in gaps and i was running really hard between the wickets to try and get as many twos as you can and if you get a really bad ball then you can try and score a boundary but um yeah my game plan was around the size of the boundaries really and we just spoke about the freedom and, and backing your game plan and I suppose something that holds so many players back is the fear of failure. How did you overcome that? Like if I get out third ball, caught on the boundary, was it just that, okay, I'm, I'm at least, as long as I stick to my game plan, I can live with that? Has that sort of helped you overcome the fear of failure or the fear of getting out? Yeah, I think once uh, you're really honest, firstly with yourself, and then you're really honest with your coaches and you're really honest with your teammates and they know what your game plan is, that if it doesn't come off, that's okay if you're playing within your game plan. If you go outside what you've told and you promise your teammates, you promise your coaches and you promise yourself, you go outside of your game plan and you get out, then that's when everyone's got the right to be really shitty with you. If you get out doing what you set out to do, you you go out, you set out to do what you've been practicing in the nets for all the, all the times you've been practicing and, you know, fine-tuning this game plan you get out doing that then no one's going to have any issues with you yeah awesome awesome now had it not been for um, your bad shoulder which you've mentioned you couldn't bowl or throw and you've just had a shoulder operation um, you probably would have been picked for the Australian T20s at, um, at the end of the Big Bash and and possibly probably for the IPL how have you had to deal with that sort of disappointment and that sort of I suppose hurt knowing you could have been progressing your, your career had it not been for the injury yep no doubt at all it's uh it was really disappointing once i sort of got that message that you know my shoulder was probably a a big reason why i wasn't getting picked to play for australia in the in the t20 format um yeah, that was really deflating because i've never really before I've, you know this is the third time i've had this shoulder operation but i've been really lucky in the sense that i haven't missed too much cricket because of it you know, it's been off season that I've been missing, but to get to that point where you know you're being held back by injury, that was disappointing. Um, but I think more than anything, I was so lucky that when I did re hurt my shoulder in the one day final, that I thought that was season over and I wasn't going to play a first class game this year, I wasn't going to play a game in the big bash. So the fact that I was still able to play cricket this season as a batter was just you know it was a bit of a miracle, really, considering how much damage I did to my shoulder. and um yeah so there's two ways to look at it I, I i don't hide away from the fact that it was really disappointing and you know you never know with the ipl auctions and stuff like that but i would love to have been able to put my name in and just uh see what would have happened you know i'd be happy to go over there for not much money just to you know spend six or eight weeks in the nets with you know lots of international superstars and you know just develop a part of your game that you probably neglect a little bit here in Australia, playing spin bowling, which is a big focus over there. And I know that that would be a really good developmental opportunity. But, you know, for me, sitting back and wishing what could have been, it's, it's not really a help for me. And, um, you know, I just, all my focus now is in my rehab and getting my shoulder right. And I'm, I'm really thankful that it, having done so much um, damage to my shoulder and being three through uh, three reconstructions now I know that I can still get back to playing 100% and I know that if I follow the steps of the, the rehab that come the start of next season I'll be I'll be fit and I'll be bowling and throwing again which is um, you know something that feels really foreign to me at the moment I've done it in so long but um, you know I give myself another opportunity at the start of next time. Nice, and it's, yeah, there's no point dwelling on what, what could be, so you've got to focus on the positives. Um, I just want to talk a bit about leadership. Um, you've captained a number of teams throughout your career, and then this year you were announced vice-captain of Western Australia, and when Mitch was away playing for Australia, you captained a number of teams. How did you find captaining WA? Uh, I think before that, I, I really enjoy leadership. It's something that um, I feel comes naturally to me. Um, you know, it's like when I started playing cricket as a kid, you just want to be involved in the game, whether it's batting, bowling, fielding, and leadership for me was just another way of, you know, being involved without having to touch the ball, really. And um, so, you know, I was lucky. I got a few opportunities coming up through age group programs to, 
to captain and then you know it sort of culminated in getting the vice captaincy this year which you know the first shield game of last season I wasn't even picked in the team so to go from not playing to you know vice captain of Western Australia was you know pretty uh pretty big hurdle for me to happen in a really short period of time um, and you know it was sort of inevitable that Mitch who did a really good job as captain in his time he was there it was sort of inevitable that he was going to get picked to play for Australia at some stage he's too good a player to you know be out of that Australian team for for too long and uh, the captaincy was really challenging um, I took it over at the back end of this season we had you know, it was awesome to see so many of our teammates playing for Australia, but at one stage we had eight guys playing for Australia, four in the T20 team and four in South Africa for the test team. Add to that, we had about seven or eight long-term injuries. You know, we were really battling and, um, you know, our depth got really tested. Um, and the back end of the season, it was, we weren't playing the cricket we wanted. Um, our performances were not meeting our expectations. Um, as a West Australian team and we place a high priority on shield cricket and you know our performances were well well below par um, and you know by the end of the season when we knew we couldn't make the shield final anymore that was it was challenging to to lead a side that was not performing as well as it wanted but I know that that's uh, that's that's my love for captaincy and um, leadership that's not wavered throughout this. It was really challenging, but I know that getting through the end of the season doing that, that you know, it can't get much tougher than that. And you know, I'm really looking forward to next season. And I know there's a really real possibility that Mitch is going to be playing for Australia for you know probably in all three formats, and that I'll be I might get that opportunity again, which is something I'm really looking forward to. Awesome. And no, like you say, it probably won't get harder. And like, no doubt you learnt a lot from it. Um, what traits do you think make a good leader or what things do you define your leadership on, I suppose? Uh, I think the traits that define leaders are really individual and there's not one common thread um, between a lot of really good leaders and I think that something about leadership is being really true to yourself, like your batting, like your game plans, you know, really be true to yourself and you know, I've had a big emphasis on not trying to become something that I'm not. Um, you know, I feel like there's a reason that anyone gets picked to be in leadership positions and that when you get picked, and it's the same as true as your batting and your bowling, all your skills, you know, you get picked to play in those sides on the back of something that you've done prior to that. And, you know, you, the selectors are picking you in the hope that you're going to replicate those performances. So I felt like I didn't need to, to change too much in, in what I do. Um, you know, it's really different responsibility um, going from pretty quickly being one of the youngest players in the team to being a leader and, you know, I, I didn't want to change too much on how I went about my playing and then transitioning into my leadership. I didn't feel like I had to change too much. Nice one. Now, just moving on to your mindset and your sort of routines and processes, have you done any form of mental conditioning at all in your, in your career? Yep, I have. I'm not the first. I will be the first one to say that, you know, I, it, I, I really struggle with the mental side of the game at times and it's something that, you know, I don't have as clear mental routines and plans as a lot of other guys do. It's something that, you know, probably stems from the backyard. Um, you know, the way I like to play cricket, be really freewheeling and uh, have as few structures as possible and that probably translated into my senior career and my mental uh, side of the game. I know that there's certainly a side of my game that there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, yeah, I, we, we have psychologists at the Wacker and I've you know, had a lot of conversations with people about it, but it's, I haven't quite knuckled down mental routines that really work for me. And you know, that's, that's a part of my game that I'm, you know, I'm still really willing to learn and get better at. Awesome, and that's great self-awareness to understand that that's something that does need to improve. So, not done any meditation or visualization or, or anything like that. Yeah, I've I've tried a lot of these things. It's more about finding something that I feel like will actually benefit me. Yeah. Um, to this point, I feel like I buy into a lot of these ideas, and then you know I can't find a way for that to translate to you know runs or wickets really on the field. So, but yeah, like I said, I'm still really willing to learn and to, to open new doors to find 
other avenues because I know that it's no coincidence that so many good players do put a lot of it down to their, their mental uh, practices. Awesome. And what about a pre-ball routine? Have you do you have something that you do physically or any and mentally? Do you sort of have a mantra or say something as a ball is running in? No, I don't at all. And you know, it can, that can get viewed as lazy or unprofessional or however you want to look at it. But it's a, it's a game. It's like all these mental practices. It's something I'm really aware of. It's something that I've definitely tried to do in the past at times, and for whatever reason, it doesn't stick with me. Or um, you know, I just don't believe in it yet i haven't found a way for it to really feel like i'm becoming a better player so you know i'm I'm leaving that window open i haven't cancelled out the possibility of you know doing it it's still something that i'm willing to investigate and look into but just at this part part of my career i haven't found a way that really works for me fair enough um and how have you found playing in front of big crowds obviously you're used to it now you go to the, the furnace or the optus stadium at the end of the big bash but Early on especially, it was probably quite foreign coming from junior cricket and, and shield cricket where there's not much. But now going out in front of 40,000, 50,000 people, how, how have you found that and been able to block out the, the distraction of the crowd? Yeah, I think it, I've sort of noticed a, a swing. And when you first, when I first started playing Big Bash, like all these teams that I get picked in for the first time, you know, I feel like I'm not ready feel like my skills aren't ready to compete at this level and at the start the crowd was really daunting because it was more like you know what could go wrong which part of my games have I you know I don't have confidence in and you know I'm gonna get found out on a big stage in front of all these people to you know building your career and you get to the stage where you start to get a lot of belief in yourself and the crowd goes from being a negative to you know what can I what skills have I got that I can you know show for this crowd and what are the good sides of my game that, you know, these people are going to get to see and, you know, can I put on a show for them and, you know, make this cricket, this 2020 product, you know, it's such an entertaining product, you know, it's a, it's a positive and, you know, the more people, the better once you really believe in yourself. Awesome. Awesome. Great insight. Now, how do you deal with a mistake? Um, I suppose something that a lot of players I see, especially young players, they, they hit a bad shot or they play and miss and they get really frustrated and really annoyed. How has your sort of journey progressed? Have you always been someone who just gets on with it or have you had to learn to put that behind you quite quickly? Yeah, I think I'm really lucky and that um, it's probably a, a strength of mine that I, I don't weigh on bad things, um, you know, bad shots. Um, you know, even getting out, like I feel like, you know, it's infuriating and you're spewing for the next day about it. But, you know, I feel like I can move on pretty quickly and comes back to that playing with freedom once you're starting to worry about stuff that's happened in the past you know you you restrict yourself and all of a sudden you're not playing with freedom and you're not clear in your in your game plan your thoughts about how to execute your game plan so even dropping catches and stuff like that is the worst feeling in the world but I feel like I've I'm pretty good at moving on um, all these things it happens to everyone and you know until you for me until I have an extended run of you know failures does it really start to play on my mind yep nice one um now what's your preparation like for a match if it's a couple of days out from a shield game mentally and physically do you do you do anything in particular do you hit a certain number of balls do you not face bowlers the day before is there anything you do like that's a a routine or is it just all however you're feeling at the time yeah well our preparation's quite scripted in the fact that we have the same sort of training sessions leading up to the games and so Probably up until uh, two days before, I'll face bowlers um, in the nets whenever they're available to bowl. And, you know, at the same time, you're facing a lot of throws and with the wangers and stuff like that. But for me, the amount of balls I hit is really until I'm really confident that I'm executing my game plan and I'm, uh, I feel like when I walk out, my next step, walking out on the ground to bat in the middle, that... Yep, my game plan in the nets is going to translate out into the middle until I get that feeling, which is, you know, it's a feeling that only you know whether you're, and you can't lie to anyone about it. You can't say, yep, I feel good when you don't because you can't lie to yourself. And it's a feeling that, you know, some days I'll have to hit for two hours a day before a game. Some days it's five minutes, just depending on how long it takes me to feel really confident in my game plan. Awesome. Great insight. Um, Now you've played with and against some of the best players in the world. What are some common traits you've seen from some of the world's best players? 
Oh, probably the batters. Um, you know, it's like nothing phases them. They didn't like enough to play against a lot of good players and um, probably more so in red ball cricket. Just nothing phases them. It does. It, they feel. They always feel in control and as a bowling side, it's really hard to develop plans and, um, you know, or have bowlers or bowling balls that really seem to fluster them and, um, it, it always feels like the game's just running on their terms. Um, you know, how they go about it, they're all so different. Everyone's got really different ways. And, you know, for me, you, you try and do copy little parts of other really good players, but at the end of the day, you're gonna do it in your own way. And um, how you do it's different to, you know, if you watch Virat Kohli bat or Steve Smith, how I'm gonna do it's really different, but I think that the, the manner that they do it in, uh, a lot can be learned from that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you're an excellent fielder. Um, is that something that's come naturally to you or is that a, a part of your game that you've worked really hard at um, in your whole cricket career? Um, I think it stems from the fact that I really enjoy fielding, oh, especially when I was growing up where you learn all your skills. I really enjoyed it and I touched on you know the early days of playing at Fremantle. Jeff Kennedy was my coach at the uh, under 13s and under 14s, under 15s at Fremantle, and he put such big emphasis on fielding, and it's something that I feel like in Australia it gets drummed into us a lot more than some of the other countries around the world where I've been lucky enough to, to go to. I feel like we put a really high price on fielding, and it's like when you start playing cricket in the backyard, you know, I just wanted to be involved, want to bat, want to bowl, whatever, want to wicket keep, and I want to field, you know, if you don't, if you're not lucky enough to get to bat or bowl, then you know the next best thing's fielding. And um, you know I'm really competitive and just want to be able to impact the game as much as I can. And for me, that fielding, uh, there's no negative of training your fielding because I know that for me at the start of my career, especially in T20 cricket, you know I was almost getting picked on my fielding. It was a really big part of why I was getting included in teams. You know, your bat and your bowl can be they can be going okay, but felt like if I was the best fielder in the team then it's you know it's hard to hard to get dropped and um, I also feel like being able to be really adaptable and do a job for the captain you know whatever they need it might be when I first came into the team I wasn't a slip fielder but when someone might have it on a string you might need a fourth slip and we'd run out of fielders so pretty quickly had to work out that like you're batting if you're, if you're not really uh, confident in your plans that you it's going to be scary playing and it's like slip catching. I knew that if I had to stand at third slip or something and I wasn't prepared, then it's the most frightening place to field in the world. But if you're really confident in the preparation, you've caught lots of balls and you're confident in what you're doing, it's the most fun place to stand in the world because you're confident you want the ball to come to you. And it's the same as being out in the boundary in front of big crowds. You know, if you're not confident in catching high balls, then it's the scariest place. But if you're really confident in all the training you've done and you want the ball to come to you, it's the most fun because, you know, you get to perform in front of all these people. So preparation for my fielding is so important. I do enjoy it, but it's something that I was lucky got drummed into me from a really young age. Awesome. And you can certainly see that in the way you do it in front of the big crowds. Now, just the last few questions. Um, how do you switch off away from cricket? What do you do to sort of get away from the game? Yeah, it's something that I'm trying to get better at. Um, you know, we talked briefly off air about my shoulder and I felt like at the end of the season, um, you know, I was probably getting a little bit mentally fatigued. You know, physically, other than my shoulder, I was going fine. And um, But I think that came from 12 months before that, having a, another shoulder operation and then you go straight into rehab and straight into pre-season and then, you know, all the trainings and I played the whole season, didn't miss a game or a training session and I felt by the end of the season just a little bit mentally exhausted and I felt like I needed a break and reflecting on this season, I know that probably the pre-season, if you're going to take a bit of time off, you don't want to miss any games, so the pre-season's the time to do that and it's something I need to get better at, you know, forcing myself to have time away because, you know, you want to have success so bad that you want to train as much as you can and play as much as you can that um, you can lose sight of, you know, your own mental health and you've got to give yourself a chance to, to switch off and, you know, I need to get better at that. So I know that going forward in this pre-season, I'm going to give myself more time away from away from the whacker and away from training, which you know I don't like doing it at the time. But I know that come the back end of a really busy summer, that I'll benefit from it. 
Absolutely, and that's something I said to you before that I tell all my athletes to have a time, have the time off now, so that you don't wake up one day and not feel up for the up for the battle. Now, you've mentioned your shoulder op. You had a shoulder op in Melbourne three three weeks ago. What does the off season now hold for you? Is it it's straight back into rehab now? Yeah, so Monday I'm into rehab. The first four weeks, pretty much um, immobilised, not moving in a sling, um, just trying to let it recover. And then you know I, st- I start rehab, and uh, so for a while it's just guys who have had surgery at the end of the season who are in the rehab. So it's a pretty quiet place to work, which can be nice sometimes. But then you know the full squad training starts in sort of June, where everyone's back training, and you know the start of that pre-season is more physical than skills phase. And then come July, you're starting to hit lots of balls, and bowlers are bowling, um, and you. You switch from the physical preparation to the the technical and skills focus uh, pretty quickly and then you transition into more scenarios and practice games before before the season starts so you know it's a process that I've you know unfortunately I've had to do before but I'm really clear on the next few months and how my preparation for this next summer looks like. And you'll be ready to go f- with the physical stuff in June, hopefully, and then the skill stuff in July? Yeah, ready to go. My throwing's probably, everything happens. Batting comes back pretty quickly, bowling a little bit longer, and then throwing a bit longer again. But I know that I don't need to do the whole preseason, um, you know, like everyone else, to, to be ready to go because I've proved before to myself that I can, you know, start a little bit later with some of my skills and still be ready to go for the start of the summer. Awesome. Now, three final questions. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Tough one. I don't know. That's um, that is a tough one. We've um, in our change rooms this year, we've sort of had a few things written up on the whiteboards, and um, one of the one of the points is. Um, it's, it's Kelly Slater's theory. I don't know if you've heard any other boys talk about it, but it's it's he said that um, um, when I don't care, you know, you know, whether I'm winning or losing, you know, normally I perform my best, and it's about just not having too much pressure on yourself and being able to to let go and be really free. And you know, that, I've mentioned it so many times today about being free and. You know, from the backyard to playing in front of big crowds is a really key indicator for me and that's something that I hadn't really thought about too much. It just sort of happened naturally and this year to have that Kelly Slater quote up in our in our change rooms, and I think that's been pretty good for me. Awesome. I think it was Hilts or Whitey. One of them did mm. mention, mention that uh, quote. Now, what's your definition of success? Well, I think it's being able to... Um, tick off goals that you set out to do because you know you can run into success accidentally but more often than not that success you achieve by you know setting goals and working out a a way to you know prepare yourself to achieve them and you know that can be really satisfying when you achieve something that you didn't think you could and you put plans into place to try and get there and then you can tick it off one day hopefully awesome great answer now finally why do you play cricket I play cricket um, because as a kid, I think that when you've got the whole world open to you and you can do anything in the world that you want, it was, you know, about you know, from when I was six or seven years old, you, know, you can do anything you want with your time. And I was out in the backyard playing cricket because that's what I would love doing. And, you know, I did it for no other reason than, you know, I had more fun playing cricket than I did, you know playing another sport or sitting inside watching TV or, you know, and that was just what I loved doing. Now that I've got the opportunity to, to do this and, you know, get paid well for something that I love doing, I'm oh, so lucky to, to be in this position. And I think that any time I have any doubts or challenging periods, you know, I think back to that, why, why did I start playing the game? And I've heard Gilly say that a few times as well especially since this recent thing in South Africa, why do you play the game? Um, and, you know, for me, that's it's just something I love doing. Awesome. What a great answer. Ash, thanks very much yes. for joining us. Thanks, thanks for your time much. and your insight. No worries.